left off, uh, the very last incident we talked about was was what? Who can remind me? I went into this whole tangent of Indian Islam, Habbadid dynasty, right? Uh, and uh, <clears throat> and we had talked about how interesting and unique and strange it is that here is one person who actually caused a miscarriage to the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu and yet Allah had written that his progeny would have great izzah and honor uh, in Islam and uh, he was one of the founders, actually is named after him. The Habbadis are named after this very person, Habbar, uh, that uh, he had an entire dynasty in what is now uh, Pakistan for over 100, 130 years or so. In any case, getting back to the story of Badr. Now, <clears throat> we talked about uh, the process of his return, we talked about the prisoners of war. What happened in Mecca? In Mecca, Ibn Kathir narrates, Ibn Kathir tells us some incidents that happened in Mecca. He tells us that the first of the soldiers to return back from Badr, the first of the, the, those who had turned their back and run away, right? Because the Quraysh had broken up Helter Skelter. They had literally just fled for their lives and then regrouped and then made their way back to uh, Mecca. And this is interesting. They didn't even have a plan B. They did not even have a plan B. What's going to happen if we fail? They were so confident that they were going to win. There's no plan of failure. What is going to happen? Where should we regroup? And so they came back to Mecca in groups and batches. The very first person who came back was uh, Al-Haysaman ibn Al-Khuzai. Al-Haysaman Al-Khuzai. Al-Haysaman Al-Khuzai. And when he entered Mecca, they saw him in his state and, and, and fashion. You can imagine, there are no details, but you can imagine bloodied, wounded, maybe his horse is missing or something, but something was definitely uh, amiss. And so uh, they asked him, what is the matter? And he answered in a dreary tone that Utba has been killed. Rabi'a has been killed. Shayba has been killed. Abu al-Hakam has been killed. Umayyah ibn Khalaf has been killed. Zum'a ibn Aswad has been killed. In other words, he doesn't even know where to begin. Like, it's complete disaster. And he lists a who's who. Abu al-Bukhtari has been killed. Abu Jahl has been killed. Now this is, as I said, it is unbelievable for them. Even for us, when you really understand the victory of Badr, Wallahi, it is just amazing. How many people, one after the other, and they were three times the strength of the Muslims. And, and, and. So he comes back and he kept on naming. Until finally, they said, this guy has gone mad. He must have gone crazy. It's not possible. He's listing everybody. Uh, you know, that everybody who is in Mecca, he's listing them. And uh, when the news reached back to Safwan ibn Umayyah, uh, now this is the son of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Safwan ibn Umayyah, the son of Umayyah ibn Khalaf, right? When the news reached back to Safwan ibn Umayyah, he was sitting with his back to the Kaaba, like inside the, the, the uh, walls of the, of the, the Kaaba, I mean, basically inside the Hijr. Uh, and he said, this is simply impossible. This man has gone crazy. Go ask him, where is Safwan ibn Umayyah, meaning himself? Because he thought he's gone crazy. So once he hears a name that is supposed to be not killed, he's going to say he's killed as well, right? So he's saying, this guy's gone crazy. Go ask him. What is the hal of Safwan ibn Umayyah? And Safwan is sitting right there, that at a distance he's looking. So somebody goes to him and says, Oh, hey Saman, and what happened to Safwan ibn Umayyah? So this is a trick question, right? So he looks at him and he said, Safwan is sitting right over there, and I saw with my own eyes how they killed his father and brother. Safwan is sitting right there, and I saw with my own eyes, I was there. When they dragged his father and, and brother and they killed him in front of me. Right. And this made them realize that this is not a crazy person, this is the truth. And slowly but surely the filters began to come back and uh, it was uh, a time of great uh, grieving, of great uh, depression. And it was as if the, the biggest icing on the cake that was to occur, it was as if Allah Azza wa Jal had willed that he saves perhaps one of the best for the very last. And that is the death of Abu Lahab. Tabbat yada Abi Lahab bin Watab. The only senior person who was of the scum of Mecca, really, the worst of Mecca, was Abu Lahab. Everybody else, we, I've said this so many times before, that those who had an ounce of decency, many times they were the ones who were saved. And the best example of this is, is who? Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan is the best example of this. And many others as well, Suhail ibn Amr and others, that generally they had some dignity, some uh, decency for themselves. And uh, what happened was, Abu Lahab, he did not participate. Why did he not participate? Who can remind me? This goes back a few lessons. Or what did he do to get out of participation? Abu Lahab. 
he hired somebody to go in his place. He hired somebody to go in his place. And also, frankly, probably because he was the uh, chief of the uh, Banu Hashim, they understood that it's a bit too awkward for him to go. So they didn't pressure him, unlike they pressured Umayyah and others, they did not pressure him to go, because this really was against everything they stood for. That is, your own mini tribe is coming uh, and fighting against you. Now, uh, when Abu Lahab heard of this news, he could not believe this, and it is said he went into a type of uh, depression. And he waited for the time of Abu Sufyan to come back. And he said, I'm going to ask Abu Sufyan directly, I don't believe any of these deserters. Maybe they ran away out of fear. Maybe something happened. I'm going to wait for my friend, Abu Sufyan. So uh, while they were uh, waiting, Abu Sufyan, finally Abu Sufyan did return. And they met at the house of Al-Abbas, who was a prisoner of war. Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet is a prisoner of war. And Abbas, of course, right now is tied up in, literally tied up in Medina. And so Abbas's wife and his servant are at home. And their uh, Abbas's brother is, of course, Abu Lahab, right? Abu Lahab is his uh, older brother. So Abu Lahab is, for some reason, perhaps that was a bigger house. We don't know the reason. He was there. And Abu Sufyan came over there to, uh, to inform him what happened. So when Abu Sufyan came, Abu Jahl said, uh, sorry, Abu Lahab said, Abu Lahab said, tell me, face to face, tell me exactly what happened. So Abu Sufyan told him that by Allah, as soon as we, meaning our side, Abu Sufyan was not there obviously, but he's hearing the news. As soon as we met the Muslims, it was as if they overpowered us without us doing anything. It was beyond our power to fight them. That they took prisoners as they pleased and they killed as they pleased. And despite all that happened, I cannot criticize my own side. I can't criticize the Quraysh. Because by Allah, I saw a group of men with white faces, riding horses that were black and white, which is the uh, epitome of Arabian horses, the stallions, right? So these were uh, men, that he thought they were men, obviously they're angels, riding horses that were black and white, hovering between the heavens and earth. None of us could empower them. None of us could overpower them. So when he's telling this news and he's dejected, he's sad, and Abu Lahab is also uh, depressed. The slave of Al-Abbas, who was listening in, and he was a slave, he's cooking the food, he's uh, preparing their whatever, you know, whatever he's preparing, he's not supposed to be listening anyway, and he's a slave, even if he's listening, he's not supposed to comment. It's not his place to comment. But these are Muslims, and this is an important point here that, now Allahu Alam, I talked about Abbas uh, two weeks ago, it appears that Abbas was a nominal Muslim up until the Battle of Badr. That he had said he's a Muslim, but that real Iman had not entered until the one incident. What is the one incident? His money. His money. The Prophet wasallam told him, where is his money? Right? And he said, Wallahi inni lashadu annaka la Rasulullah. That that was when very clear that now for sure, this person is the Prophet of Allah. So what this means is that his wife, his slave, they have embraced Islam from before. It is also said, by the way, that his wife, Umm al-Fadl, uh, she had embraced Islam, the second lady after Khadija. That she is a very early convert. And perhaps this explains, Abbas had embraced kind of sort of because of her, right? And so he's kind of nominal. And then it takes a while for Iman to enter his heart as it did in the Battle of Badr. After the Battle of Badr, he... Uh, is a Muslim and he is sending reports to the Prophet as he will do in Uhud and later on, right? So in the Battle of Badr, this is the turning point for him. His wife is a Muslim and obviously we'll learn his slave is also a Muslim now. So his slave is listening in and he hears all of this and he's eager to find out what happened. When he hears this, he jumps up for joy and he says, Ay Wallah, those were the angels. Ay Wallah, those were the angels helping the Muslims. Now it's pretty clear where his loyalty is. It's pretty clear he couldn't help himself that he's so happy that the Muslims won. He jumped up and he basically said, Allahu Akbar. You know, that's the equivalent, you know. Like he's so happy that the Muslims won. Now Abu Lahab, when he saw this slave commenting back to him, rejoicing at the defeat of the Quraysh, he, his anger just basically, he lost it. He lost his anger. And he jumped up, threw him to the ground, 
started beating him almost to death. And he's a slave, he can't really, if he, even if he wanted to defend, I mean, he's going to have a worse ending later on, you know. And when his slave is being pummeled, now Umm al-Fadl, the wife of Abbas, she comes out and she physically tries to stop Abu Lahab from killing the slave. And he turns on her and he begins beating her up. Now this is a man who's, he's lost it, right? He's basically all of that frustration. And she is now wounded. And so she responds back with the fierceness, the anger, the ferocity. She says, so when the Sayyid, meaning Al-Abbas, the Sayyid meaning the Lord of the house, when the Sayyid is gone, this is what you do to his household? Meaning what type of protector are you? You're supposed to be our protector. You are, you know, my brother-in-law. You're the chieftain. And when the Sayyid goes away, this is what you do. You beat my, his wife, you beat, uh, you almost kill the slave. And uh, this made him feel so ashamed. He fled from the house in a state of humiliation and guilt. And uh, he was afflicted with a type of disease. So the books of Tafsir, uh, the books of Sirah mention various diseases. Uh, but he was not seen basically after this. And he died uh, a death out of sickness. We're not going to call it a natural death. He died as a result of misery, as a result of whatever it is. Some say a type of worm came to him. But uh, within a few days after this incident, he uh, passed away. He died. And so Allah Azza wa Jal basically got rid of the very last of those evil batch of the Quraysh. And this last one was none other than the uncle of the Prophet Abu Lahab. Abu, uh, Ibn Ishaq mentions that once all of the, pres once all of the people of uh, uh, Quraysh returned, Makkah was enveloped with the wailing noises of the women. You know how the women used to wail in the days of Jahiliyyah. That all of Makkah began to wail. Every household had somebody wailing. Remember the dream of Attica all the way so many months back? The dream of Attica, we talked about it, right? Every house a boulder came and hit it. So this is now that reality. Every house was wailing. And when Abu Sufyan heard all of this, he convened a gathering of the Quraysh and he said, for the first time in the history of the Arabs, he said, from now on, no woman shall wail. Why? Because we don't want to cause any happiness to the Muslims when they hear that all of Mecca is wailing. Right? You see the, the point here? That we don't want any pleasure to be derived from our women wailing. And so, the decree came that it is not allowed for women to uh, wail. This was the only time the Jahili uh, Arabs did this. And it is said that uh, Al-Aswad ibn al-Muttalib, who is a distant uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, he had lost all three of his sons uh, at Badr. And it is said, uh, Hisham mentions that one night he heard a woman wailing. So he became happy and he said, go and ask her, has the ban been lifted so that I can wail over my son? And he especially he loved his youngest. His name was Zum'a uh, Zum ibn al-Aswad. Zum'a uh, Zum ibn al-Aswad was one of the big names in uh, the Battle of Badr that died on the side of the Quraysh. So he said, go find out from that woman. Perhaps the wailing ban has been lifted so that I can wail over my son uh, Zum'a. The servant went, came back and said, no, she's not wailing over her uh, loved one. She's wailing over a lost camel. Because you're allowed to wail over anything other than Badr. So she's wailing over a lost camel. Ibn Kathir mentions here that this was a further means that Allah used to punish them. Because they would derive much comfort in wailing over their dead. And it would make their pain more bearable. When everybody's wailing and the household comes together and the women are all raising their voices and whatnot, this would bring them a sense of of comfort. Why? Because we're showing that we are making up for our loved one. We're showing our loss, our grief. So by showing our grief, this is bringing comfort to our hearts. Ibn Kathir says, by Abu Sufyan preventing the wailing, Allah was using this to make their grief even more. They have to bottle up their grief. They're not even allowed to cry as they were uh, used to crying. Uh, now there's another interesting incident related to the Battle of Badr which is mentioned in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, and all of you know of it uh, in, in a vague manner, uh, but not, not many uh, people associate it with this incident, the Battle of Badr. And that is that on the same day as the Battle of Badr, many hundreds of miles away, the Byzantine Romans and the Sassanid Persians were fighting. 
many thousands of miles away. And in a twist of fate that was unexpected, Allah's qadr obviously, in a twist of fate that was completely unexpected, the Persians were viciously defeated. The Persians were defeated, despite the fact that the Romans were going down for a while, and the Persians were getting bigger and bigger, right? And they had had a major war before this, a few years ago, and Allah had revealed Surah Al-Rum, the first ayat. Alif Lam Mim Ghulibat Al-Rum. Now, the Surah Al-Rum came down perhaps the seventh year of the Hijrah, perhaps the sixth year, sorry, not the Hijrah, uh, the Da'wah, the sixth or the seventh year of the Da'wah, early on in uh, Mecca, the middle of the Meccan stage. And the Roman power was going down, was ebbing, and the Persian power was getting stronger and stronger. And so, Allah Azza wa Jal told the Muslims, Alif Lam Mim Ghulibat Al-Rum. Alif Lam Mim, the Romans have been defeated, meaning in this battle that already taken place. This is one of the most explicit predictions in the Quran because it's clearly in the future. Ghulibat al is in the past. The Romans have been defeated. This happened already. Then Allah says, But after this defeat, After this defeat, They will be the victors. In a few years. لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمِنْ بَعْدُ To Allah belongs the ultimate control from the beginning to the end. وَيَوْمَئِذٍ يَفْرَحُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ بِنَصْرِ اللَّهِ And on that day, the day that the Romans win over the Persians, the believers will be celebrating the victory of Allah. So there's two predictions. Number one, the Romans will win over the Persians. And number two, on the very day that that is happening, the Muslims will يَفْرَحُون will be rejoicing with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, uh, when the Surah Al-Rum came down, Ubay ibn Khalaf, who is no longer alive now, Ubay ibn Khalaf went to Abu Bakr and he mocked him. And he said, do you really think that the Romans will win the Persians after this vicious defeat? After this humiliating defeat? And had we been alive as well, we would have sympathized politically that it's impossible for this mighty nation. The Romans had a lot of internal conflict going on. The Persians had consolidated. They had had a lot, a lot of victories. And it was just one victory after another. And Allah predicted something that was unbelievable. He said the Romans would be victorious over the Persians. So Ubay said, do you really think that the Romans will win over the Persians? And Abu Bakr said, yes, of course I do. So Ubay said, let us wager, let us bet. Let us see who's right. And this was, of course, in the days of Mecca. And uh, there, you know, there's no haram you know, betting, firstly. Secondly, you're not betting because you know the outcome, right? So whatever you want to do, you cannot justify gambling from this, uh, from this uh, uh, incident. So uh, they set a wager. They set an amount. And Ubay uh, said, how many years? Because the Quran says, fi bid'i. And bid'i means in a few. So Ubay said, how many years? So Abu Bakr said, six years. Six years. Six years passed, and the Romans didn't win the Persians. So Abu Bakr lost the bet. So he had to pay up all of the camels that he had promised. He had to uh, pay up. Now, battle of Badr, Ubay dies. On the very same day as the battle, and we know this from non-Muslim books of history. And by the way, this is an interesting point here, that Islamic seerah, it coincides perfectly with Western events when you read them. And those people who doubt the preservation of sunnah, those people who doubt have hadith been preserved or not, those people who doubt the seerah has it been preserved or not, every incidence we find, we can link it to its equivalent. And this clearly shows us, historically speaking, that uh, the seerah has been preserved to a great extent. So we know for a fact that on the very same day as Badr, Heraclius had launched a fierce offensive against Khusro II. Heraclius launched a fierce offensive against Khusro II, and by the Qadr of Allah, Khusro II, two of his generals defected. Two of his major flanks defected. And one of his family members plotted against Khusro to have overthrown him. You know how it goes with these royal families, right? And so, right before the battle, it's as if his right hand was cut off. Khusro, I mean. It's as if, you know, internally there's things going on. Two of the generals with their entire flanks, they're not fighting on his side. And therefore, he suffered a resounding defeat 
on the exact same day as the Battle of Badr being fought outside of Medina, a thousand something miles away in the in the lands of Khorasan, in the lands of Iran, modern Iran, the uh, armies of Khosrow uh, the second had a very very uh, dismal, if you like, uh, defeat and. Allah Azza wa Jal predicted this so many years before and the Muslims did not even find out on the day of Badr. Because it's going to take two weeks for the news to reach them. And of course by that time it's too late. Abu Bakr has lost the bet. Ubay is already dead. And uh, it is said, there is a weak hadith in this regard, that when the Prophet ﷺ heard, he said, uh, and this hadith is most likely weak, but uh, linguistically it's right. He said, why did you say six? Bidri can mean up till nine, which is true. Linguistically, it's true. Why did you say six? In a few years, and the Arabic few, it goes from three to nine. So Abu Bakr took the middle. Six to nine, it goes, th sorry, three to nine, he said six is the middle. And it is said, and most likely the hadith is weak, but, but linguistically it's right, that uh, the Prophet told him, why did you say six? You should have said nine. And in fact, it was in fact eight and a half years after the ayah came down that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them uh, that victory. One or two final points and then inshallah we will uh, show uh, some slides and then do surah anfal. Uh, one or two final points about the battle of Badr. Uh, firstly, the status of the people of Badr. I've already mentioned, Jibreel came down himself and he asked the Prophet ﷺ that how do you view the people of Badr? And the Prophet ﷺ responded, we view them as the best of us. And so Jibreel said, similarly, we view the angels who participated in Badr as the best of us. So Allah sent Jibreel down to inform us the status of the people of Badr. And in Sahih Bukhari, Imam al-Bukhari has a whole book called the Book of the Blessings of the People of Badr. And full of ahadith. And... Uh, one of them is uh, the uh, Sahabi by the name of Haritha ibn Suraqa. He had died a shaheed and it is said he was one of the first shaheeds in the battle of Badr and he was killed by a stray arrow. It came out of nowhere and it, uh, and it killed him. Uh, and so Haritha's mother came from the Ansar and she said, tell me about my son. Is he in Jannah? And the Prophet ﷺ said that my dear mother, my dear aunt, it is not a Jannah he is in. He is in Jinan. He is in many Jannas and he is in Al Firdaus Al A'la. He's not just in a Jannah, he is in many Jannas and he is in Al Firdaus Al A'la. And one of the main evidences uh, or the, one of the main uh, things that is used to show the status of the people of Badr is that very famous narration, an incident of Hatib, which we're going to go into much later on, inshallah, when we get there. Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a, who uh, in the conquest of Mecca, he betrayed the trust of the Prophet ﷺ by sending the information of the advent of the Muslims to the Quraysh. The conquest of Mecca was a total surprise. The Quraysh were not expecting it. It was a total surprise. Hatib sent a letter to the Quraysh warning them, the Muslims are coming, prepare. Why he did it, what's the story, we'll get there inshallah when we get there. For now know that Hatib sent a letter to the Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ, Jibreel came and told him or else he would not have known. Jibreel came and told him, such and such a lady has the piece of paper on her belongings. Go and search her. So Ali and Abbas went and they brandished their swords and they forced it out. It was in her hair. She undid her hair in the middle of her hair. She took the letter. They opened it up. It said from Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a to uh, Quraysh. Beware, the Muslims are coming. That's basically treason. It's treachery, right? And Umar ibn al-Khattab is fuming. He said, Ya Rasulullah, give me the word khalas. And this is one of the times that actually fully justified. Fully justified, right? Give me the word and we'll just execute him. And the Prophet called Hatib. And he said, Hatib, why did you do this? Why did you do this? And Hatib said, Ya Rasulullah, I have no desire to love kufr over Islam. You know me, I'm not going to love kufr over Islam. But all of you, you have your your izzah, your protection from other sources. As for me, I'm a nobody and my family is still and my belongings are still there. And I knew Allah would protect you. I know no, no harm is going to come to you. Something's going to happen to save you. But by giving this letter, I hope that they would spare my family. So he's worried about his family. He's worried about uh, you know, his, his uh, loved ones in Quraysh and Makkah that they might kill when they hear Hatib is coming and his family is there. They're just going to kill his family. So he said that this caused me to, uh, to do this letter that they might then save my family. 
So the Prophet said, Sadaqa Hatib. Hatib is telling the truth that this was his reason. That he had some un- weird understanding that, okay, Allah is going to protect him. He's not going to actually get harmed. So, you know, let me just make sure my family is safe. Umar once again said, Ya Rasulullah, allow me to cut his head off. Some say for the first time he said it out of nifaq, that because he's a munafiq, the second time, okay, even if he's not a munafiq, but this is treason. This is treachery. So let me kill it for a crime, not for kufr. You see the difference, right? You can kill for nifaq and kufr, you can kill for a crime. So the second time he's saying, let me kill him for the crime. So the Prophet ﷺ rebuked Umar. And he said, Ya Umar, wama yudrik? How do you know that Allah Azza wa Jal, perhaps he looked at the people of Badr. Notice it's coming out of so many years later. Five years after Badr, he is saying this. Six years after Badr, he is saying, how do you know? Perhaps Allah looked at the people of Badr and He said to them, I'malu ma shi'tum. Do as you please because you are forgiven. Do as you please because you have been forgiven. Right? So in other words, He used Badr to protect Hatib's life. He used Badr to raise the status of uh, Hatib. And therefore the Sahaba who participated at Badr are considered to be of the elite of the Sahaba. And that is why many of our classical scholars, including Ibn Hisham, Ibn Kathir, they actually took the time, pages and pages, to list every single Sahabi who participated in Badr. Literally, all 300 and something of them, one by one, they're listing them. It's in Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, it is in uh, Ibn Kathir, so many of the books of Sirah, out of respect and honor, uh, who, who participated in the Battle of Badr. Uh, and the final point for the Battle of Badr, what were some of the primary effects of the Battle of Badr? Well, number one, it established beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Muslims have a political presence, a legitimate political entity, that they are a separate and independent state, and that the Quraysh have to deal with them as a tangible reality. So all doubts that might have existed are now gone, that the Muslims are here to stay. Number two, it was the greatest demoralizing factor for the Quraysh. That it can honestly be said, if you look at the seerah, that this was the single greatest shock in the entire seerah. And everything else that happened is trivial compared to Badr. Why? Because you can say Ahzab, you can say the conquest of Mecca, they already know the Muslims are a presence and a threat. At Badr, they genuinely thought that they're going to eliminate them off the face of this earth. At Badr, there was no concept that the Muslims have any potential of victory. And not just that, but the list of those who were killed, the list of the Quraysh who were decimated, was simply, uh, it's just a who's who of every single famous person. So the miraculous win, uh, those that had died, the humiliation of the prisoners of war, all of these factors, it was a huge demoralizing blow. And every single defeat afterwards, it is as if it is simply just a tafsir of what happened at uh, Badr. And the third primary effect of Badr is that Badr brought out for the first time internal treachery within Medina. And that is two fronts. Number one, the Munafiqun. And number two, the Yehudi tribes. That up until that point in time, there was no genuine animosity. Maybe some sarcastic comments from some people, but nothing that was clear cut. After Badr, this was going to change. And after Badr, a number of incidents happened that simply made things from bad to worse with regards to these two uh, groups of people. And with this, uh, we will inshallah ta'ala show uh, the slides that our dear uh, brother Dr. Bashar has prepared. Uh, last time he taught the Sira class, he told me to take a look at them. And inshallah, it's very, actually very impressive, mashallah, that he has uh, done. Uh, he has a map of Badr. If we can turn that on. And then inshallah, we'll do uh, as much of Surah Anfal as we can. So those of you who don't have a Quran, might, now might be a good time to get a translation of the Quran. Or the Arabic, if you want to go over the Arabic. It is still here. Try again, one more time. Control, I'll delete. <laughs> Shift F5. <laughs> was it working before? Yeah. It was?
still not working. Which one? Okay, we have lift off. So this is taken straight from uh, Dr. Bashar's uh, PowerPoint, and we just want to show the uh, pictures here. Uh, you see the pictures here. Which one is? Uh, the highlighted. Yeah. This. Hmm? This one. Okay. So. Oh, it's not going to show, isn't it? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, in any case, I mean, to be honest, it's very self-explanatory. Uh, so you see the caravan coming down from Syria, uh, and the red is the caravan. You see the caravan coming down. Look at where is Syria, where is Medina, and where is Mecca. That med the whole point of the strategic location of uh, Medina, no caravan could pass going up or down from Syria to Syria, back from Syria, except that they're going to pass by the vicinity of uh, Mecca. Uh, sorry, Medina. And therefore, this is why the Quraysh were very concerned and they kept on having to go to war with the Muslims. So, there is the caravan of Abu Sufyan. He hears that the Muslims have left Badr and so he makes his way closer to the shore, which is basically uh, towards Yambur, is what the city is now. That city over there now is Yambur, towards Yambur. He makes his way towards Yambur and he uses a route that is right next to the seashore to get away from the Muslim camp Otherwise, he would have passed through, straight through Badr. He would have passed through to get to Mecca. And that is why the Muslims were on their way. There it is. Where did, how, where did that come from? Nope, that's not, that's not for me. But where is the remote? Mustafa has it. Okay. <laughs> yes, Mustafa, it is working. <laughs> yes, from there. MashaAllah. Okay. We should use this in the khutbah, right? <laughs> okay, let's see how we do this. Yalla, tayyib. So we find, uh, I'm going to take a while to get used to this. Okay, we find that the uh, Muslims, I mean, so that the Quraysh would have come down. This is really weird. They would have come down from, because I can't point towards there, right? <laughs> Let me see. Okay, it's kind of working. They would have come down from Badr all the way to Mecca, but instead he turns uh, basically towards Yambur to make his way towards Mecca. Now, and so basically he escapes from the, uh, from the Muslims in this manner. Now, the army from Mecca leaves and they know exactly where to go because they're going to meet the Muslims exactly at Badr, which was the route that Abu Sufyan would have come from had he gone the normal route. And here is the plain of Badr. This is the plain of Badr from uh, Google Maps. And right over there, right over there, this is, this is the location of the wells and they say, this is where those people were buried. Uh, this is where uh, Abu Jahad and all of them were thrown into, the, uh, were thrown into the, the well. Of course, these days there's no well left, obviously. There is no water anymore at Badr. Uh, I have visited the, 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 the city. So there, this is the city up here. If you look very carefully, you will find a small, you know, it's like a little village. It's like just a few hundred people living there. Uh, and uh, the main reason really is like a tourist place. People go there and they uh, want to see the battle. Otherwise, there's no commerce or anything of that over there. Uh, and so you just see the plains of Badr. That's all that you can see. Now, notice here that this is a mountain. These are lava rocks. These are lava rocks as well. The Muslims will find... The, the, the map has, should have been expanded a little bit broader. The Muslims were camped in this area. And the Quraysh were camped in this area, as we will see here. This was this is the well now. This is the well, okay. And the Muslims came from this area, and the Quraysh came from that area. So, initially, when the Muslims arrived, the, this was where they thought they should camp. But then uh, the Prophet was suggested by Al Hubab ibn Mundir that why are you camping over here unless this is Wahi? We should camp at a front location so that the well is behind us and we close the smaller wells. These smaller wells, we will block them up, right? So the major well was where the bodies were eventually buried. So these smaller wells were basically filled with sand, so the Quraysh had no water throughout that time except the water that they had from Mecca. So because of this, uh, the Muslims then marched forward and they set up their camp. They got rid of all of the other wells, as, uh, as I said, and then they set up their camp such that the well was within their distance. The night before the battle, the rain falls as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, and we'll talk about that. 
And the Quraysh then come on the 17th of Ramadan and the Prophet ﷺ sets up, as we said before, uh, the spears, the archers, and the infantry. He sets them up in rows, in ranks for the first time in Arabian history. And perhaps this was one of the tactics that Allah Azza used also to defeat the Quraysh because the Quraysh were never used to uh, military rows, as we had said. They were not used to this uh, strategy. And then the Quraysh sent their three to do Mubaraza, and those three were Walid, Shayba, and Utba, two brothers and uh, a son. And the Prophet said, sent Ali and Ubaidah and Hamza. The three of them, they fought. Ubaidah was mortally wounded. Uh, and eventually, he, Hamza and Ali had to come to his rescue, but he died after that. And then the Quraysh attacked the army. The Quraysh attacked the Muslims. And it was at this point in time that the Muslims began the offensive. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ basically told them, charge to meet a Jannah whose width is as broad as the heavens and the earth. So when the Muslims charged the Quraysh, they uh, fled in their ranks and they turned around and they fled helter-skelter and they made their way back to uh, Mecca. And as I said, one opinion has it that the Prophet ﷺ intentionally left this open. There was only one escape route. They could not have escaped from here. This way is back towards Medina. There's only one escape route. And he could have maybe sent a contingent. One opinion has it that he purposely left a route, escape route so that they could uh, not fight to the death, basically, and basically run away uh, in, in, in cowardice. And then the Muslims uh, continued forth, and they camped over here for three days to show the victory, to show that they had uh, won over the uh, battle. And uh, then we can get back to this, inshallah. And I wanted to go over Surah Al-Anfal, so if all of you can have Surah Al-Anfal opened up, which is, of course, the eighth surah of the Qur'an. And pretty much the entire surah is about the Battle of Badr. And I purposely wanted to go over it. I don't know if we can finish all of it. I'm going to have to go at a super fast uh, speed. So I, forgive, uh, I ask your forgiveness for this. But I want you all to basically understand all of the points of the Battle of Badr and then see that pretty much every single major incident is alluded to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins. Now, by the way, from the beginning, we learned, therefore, that Surah Al-Anfal came down on the plains of Badr. On the plains of Badr. This is when Anfal was revealed. So literally the Muslims are still camped. All of this is going on. So it's fresh. So can you imagine their minds would know. So the references, I mean, I have no doubt in my mind that there are many references in Surah Al-Anfal that we won't ever know. Because they're gone now from memory. But the, the Muslims understood them. You understand what I'm saying? That the, the memory is fresh and Allah revealing a surah Perhaps there are many incidents that is indirectly alluded to and yani, we don't have the direct knowledge of them. But of course we have a lot of uh, indirect and a lot of specific stories. So let us begin. They ask you about uh, Anfal, the, the, the war booty. Tell them that Anfal belongs to Allah and His Messenger. So fear Allah and amend that which is between you and obey Allah and His Messenger if you are believers. In other words, stop fighting about money. The Sahaba... They weren't fighting, they were disagreeing. We had mentioned this. Remember some of them said, remember the three camps, right? Some said we were protecting the Prophet Some said we went out to charge. Some said we were, uh, you know, the second guard, this and that. So Allah is saying, don't have these disagreements. وَأَصْلِحُوا ذَاتَ بَيْنِكُمْ Forgive all of these, not forgive isn't a good word, but uh, reconcile. وَأَصْلِحُوا that come together, all of you, and have taqwa of Allah and obey Allah if you are truly believers. Verily, the believers are those who when Allah is mentioned, their hearts become fearful. And when His ayat are recited, their iman goes up and they put their trust in Allah. The ones who pray and who give their uh, money, these are the true believers. They are the ones who have their ranks with Allah and forgiveness and a noble provision. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding them of the real goal. It's not this money, it's not anfal. It is Iman in Allah, it is Taqwa, it is Salah, it is Dhikr. And Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying, you want a sign of Iman? This is a sign of Iman. That when my name is mentioned, your heart should tremble. Right? And uh, when my ayat are recited, then your Iman goes up. This is the sign of believer, of a believer. Now Allah mentions that, كَمَا أَخْرَاجَكَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَيْتِكَ بِالْحَقِّ That it is just as if, so Allah Azza wa Jalla is now starting the incident of Badr. That your Lord caused you to leave your house. He brought you out of your houses for the truth. Even though a group of the believers did not like this. What is the reference here? The reference here is when they discovered that 
it is the army instead of the caravan. When they discovered it is the army instead of the caravan, there was some hesitation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this. A, a group of them said, or the, 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 in the books of Sirah, it said, a group of them said, O Messenger of Allah, we're not prepared, let's go back. We're not prepared, we don't have armor. And it was the elite, it was Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, it was the, of course, all of the, the Quraysh, uh, I mean, all of the Muhajirun, excuse me, the Muhajirun, and the elite of the Ansar. Some of the Ansar, they were a bit shaky, like, we're not ready for this, how are we going to fight them? So Allah references those. And, and notice here, by the way, that Allah is criticizing, but at the same time, He describes them with what term? Mu'minun. And Mu'minun is a high term. Allah didn't say Muslim, right? And therefore, this is a consolation to them. That yes, they, they made an error here, but they still have Iman. And Iman is a praise. It's not, Islam is not a praise. Islam is generic. Everybody has Islam. Iman is a higher praise. Iman is the second level. And Allah says, the mu'mins, they fell into this mistake. They didn't want it. They were arguing with you. يُجَادُلُونَكَ فِي الْحَقِّ That let's go back, Ya Rasulullah. We'll get prepared. We'll get armor. You know, we can be prepared for them. Even after the truth was made clear to them, meaning you had told them that Allah had promised me victory. Even after this, they still find it, found it hard. They were so terrified. So Allah describes their internal state of mind. They were so terrified it was as if you were, not you, it was as if they were about to be killed while they're looking at their executioner. So notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that they were so terrified, yet that terror did not negate their iman. It's possible for the believer to be a little bit scared or very scared. They were terrified of death. And Allah Azza wa Jal says it was as if they are being dragged to their deaths when they look at their executioner, but you had promised them victory would come. And that's what Allah says in the next ayah. Allah had already promised you. Now remember the first day of Badr, the Prophet has said, Allah has promised me victory no matter who we meet. And when there was a bit of a doubt, is it army, is it, is it the, the caravan? The Prophet had announced to them, my Lord has promised me one of the two shall be mine. So the promise has been given. So Allah reminds them, That remember, Allah had promised you one of the two would be yours. And you wanted the one that was less harmful, that was not armed, i.e. the caravan, to be yours. But Allah wanted to establish the truth with His words and to eliminate the kafirin. So you wanted the dunya and Allah wanted something else. Once again, this is not a criticism. It is Allah Azza wa Jal is explaining that your short-sightedness is different than my long-term wisdom. You wanted the immediate ghanima, the, the caravan of Abu Sufyan. And I had bigger plans in mind. Why? So that the truth can be made clear and the battle can be destroyed even if the sinners do not like this. Remember, when you were asking your Lord for help, if this ayah came down on the same day as Badr, this is in the morning. And if it is the next day, this is the day before, right? In the morning of Badr, the process of making the dua. So this ayah is fresh. Everybody remembers. Can you imagine the vivid memory of the Prophet raising his dua, making his dua, his upper garment falls down, Abu Bakr comes and puts his hand down. This is this reference now. Remember, you were the ones pleading for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you. So I responded to you that I will help you with a thousand angels, one after the other, coming down. And I only said this to you so that it will be good news. I didn't need to tell you, you're going to win. But I told you to comfort you. So you are comforted. You know that you're going to win and realize that victory is only from Allah and Allah is Azizun Hakim, exalted and wise. Remember as well. So Allah is reminding them of all of their favors that just happened. Remember as well when you were overcame with sleep, with drowsiness, as a blessing and a security from Him. Right? So the night before, when everybody is terrified, Wallah, we cannot sleep if we have an interview the next day. We cannot sleep if we have an exam the next day. Right? And they have a battle and they fell asleep. So Allah is saying, remember, when I sent down to you sleep, and I sent down rain, 
when sleep overcame you and I sent rain upon you. Why? لِيُطَهِّرَكُمْ بِهِ To cleanse you spiritually and physically. Spiritually was a cleansing. Even physically, it's refreshing to have a little bit of a drenching, a little bit of a bath. And and وَيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ رِجْزَ الشَّيْطَانِ To get rid of the evils of shaitan and to make your feet steadfast. To make the ground around you firm. إِذْ يُوحِي رَبُّكَ إِلَى الْمَلَائِكَةِ أَنِّي مَعَكُمْ Remember when your Lord told the angels that I am with you. So strengthen those who believe. فَثَبِّتُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا ثَبِّتُوا here. Ibn Abbas and others said that you complete what the believers are doing. Remember we talked about this. That every time a believer did something, the angel followed up. Right? So the believer raised his whip. Without seeing his own whip, he hears a whip and he sees the effect of a whip. He didn't do anything. So this is thabat. Thabat means to affirm, to make, to strengthen. So the Muslims started, the angels finished. So ثَبِّتُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا سَأُلْقِي فِي قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا الرُّعْبِ That Allah is speaking in the first person now. I am the one who is going to uh, throw into the hearts of those who have rejected me. I am going to throw into their hearts fear. فَضْرِبُوا فَوْقَ الْأَعْنَاقِ Now the command is to the angels, or some say to the believers, and some say to both, that go and strike the enemy at their neck and strike them. كُلَّ بَنَانِ كُلَّ بَنَانِ could mean the fingertips and it could mean at every uh, joint. That is because, why is there such harsh, harshness towards these people? They have opposed Allah and His Messenger. شَاقُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And شَاقَ means to do everything you can to prevent, to do everything you can to stop. So these people aren't just disbelievers. It's one thing to be a kafir. These are those who have wanted Islam to be destroyed. They have gone against Islam in every way possible and whoever does this will find Allah to be severe in punishment. ذَلِكُمْ فَذُوقُوهُ Go ahead, taste this for what you have done. ذَلِكُمْ means because of that فَذُوقُوهُ Taste it. Because of your attitude, because of your arrogance, Taste the punishment of Allah and verily what is going to await you in the adab of nar will be even worse than this. O you who believe, when you meet those who disbelieve, advancing towards you, do not turn your back in flight. فَلَا تُوَلُّهُمُ الْأَدْبَارِ Whoever turns his back on that day, unless there is a reason to do so, for example, he's joining another group or it's a tactic of strategy, has faced anger from Allah and his refuge or his place of abode will be the fire of hell and what a evil destination. Uh, scholars say this ayah was abrogated by the end of the surah. That in fact it was never applicable. It was as if Allah Azza wa Jal told them in the beginning that you never have an excuse to turn around. Then the majority opinion by the end of the same surah, we'll come to it, Allah gave them uh, an excuse. What is that excuse? If you are outnumbered, you may flee. If you're outnumbered, you may flee. And therefore, it was as if Allah is saying, this is the asl, the basic ruling. And there are some commandments that have been abrogated that were never implemented. There are some commandments in the Quran that have been abrogated that were never implemented. And the wisdom is very clear that when Allah says, you have no excuse to turn around, what impression do we get? Then Allah says, well, if you're outnumbered 10 to 1, which is what the Quran says. If you're outnumbered 10 to 1, then you can turn around. right? So clearly, it's as if you... Be, being given the ideal, then you're given a concession. ذَلِكُمْ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ مُوهِنُ كَيْدِ الْكَافِرِينَ That that is so. ذَلِكُمْ here, there is no English equivalent. It, it is as if we say, so be it, or this is the case. ذَلِكُمْ And Allah Azza wa Jal will weaken the plot of the kafirin. Verse number 19. إِن تَسْتَفْتِحُ إِن تَسْتَفْتِحُ The reference here is to the Quraysh. If you are asking Allah for a victory, verse number. Oh, did I skip something? Sorry. Sorry, I skipped something. I skipped 17. فَلَمْ تَقْتُلُوهُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ قَتَلَهُمْ That uh, you did not kill them, but Allah Azza wa Jal killed them. And you did not throw when you threw, but it was Allah who threw. We explained this verse that at the beginning of the battle, the Prophet ﷺ took those pebbles and those stones and he threw it into the entire army. And Allah says, that وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى That it wasn't you who was throwing when you threw, but rather it was Allah who threw. And there's a beautiful point of qadr here, that the Prophet ﷺ, Allah affirmed that he did throw. وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ That the Prophet ﷺ did throw. إِذْ رَمَيْتَ 
If Allah had said, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى It would have been that you have no will. You are like a robot. And this is not the belief of Ahl sunnah Ahl sunnah don't believe in Jabr. Jabr is called Allah forces us to do. We don't believe this. Ahl sunnah is not Jabr. And neither is it the opposite, which is denying Qadr. Ahl sunnah is in the middle. And this ayah is an evidence that Ahl sunnah uses. Why? Because did the Prophet ﷺ throw? Yes. And did he have the intention to throw? Was he called the thrower? Yes. So Allah is saying, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى It wasn't you who threw when you threw. Rather it was Allah who threw. So he did throw. But the effects of that throw, Allah Azza wa Jal was the one who caused it to go over all of the uh, Quraysh. And so that he may test the believers. Or bala can mean test and bala can mean reward. That he may reward the believers with a good reward or he may test the believers with a good test. And verily Allah is Sami and Alim. That is so and Allah will weaken the plot of the uh, kafirin. Verse number 19 now. That if you Quraysh in tastaftihu, if you are asking for victory, then your dua has been responded to. This is the dua of, of which who? Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl. That when Abu Jahl made a dua, it is said he made it twice, once at the Kaaba before they left, and once while facing the army. And he said the same thing. Oh Allah, whichever of the two of us has been more, uh, has broken away more from the traditions of his fathers, and has done more against uh, you know, the, 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 the family bonds, right? Then which of us has done no, sorry, which, was, which, yeah, which one of us has done uh, more harm and broken more? Then help the one against this. Help those who are closer to the original uh, religion of, of, of the Arabs, which is Ibrahim alayhi salam. Help the ones who are closer to family ties against the ones who have broken away. So the, uh, Allah Azza wa is saying, your dua has been responded to. In tastaftihu faqad ja'akum al fatah You wanted the victory for the, one of the two that was closer, you got it. And that was against you. وَإِن تَنْتَهُ But if you stop, it will be better for you. وَإِن تَعُودُ If you come back, نَعُودُ We will come back. And all of your money and all of your power will not help you even if it is a lot because Allah is with the believers. O you who believe, obey Allah and His Messenger and do not turn away while you are hearing the orders. And do not be like those who say we have heard while they do not hear. Verily the worst of the living in the eyes of Allah are those who are deaf and dumb who do not use their reason. And if Allah had known any good in them, He would have made them hear. And if He had made them hear, they would have still turned around rejecting you. Now the reference here is to those who, uh, the, that Allah Azza wa is saying that the, the people who have been blessed with hearing and seeing and aql and intellect, but don't use it, they are the worst of mankind. Basically, summun bukmun umyun fahum la yarji'un fahum la ya'qilun. Summun bukmun umyun. They have the capacity to speak and to hear and to see, but they don't use it properly. So Allah Azza wa is saying, when you have blessed with aql and you don't use it, you are the worst in the eyes of Allah. When you have been blessed with eyes, but you don't use it to see the truth. Now, by the way, those people who say that the dead can hear, remember the whole controversy? They use this ayah here. Because Allah is saying that, If Allah knew there was good in them, He would cause them to hear, meaning a hearing that would guide them, a hearing that would benefit them. So those who say the dead can hear, they say, the verses that say the dead cannot hear are a hearing of benefit and not a hearing of just faculty, cognitive faculty. Go back to that discussion that we did. O you who believe, respond and obey and hearken to the call of Allah and His Messenger when they call you to that which will give you life. And know that Allah comes between every man and his heart and that you shall go back to Him. So the call here is primarily the call for qital. The call for fighting against the Quraysh. And, Allah, and generally speaking, qital is death. Right? And Allah is saying, come to the call that will give you life. In this is the life of Islam. Think about it. We would not be here today if they hadn't done what they did then. There were only 85 of the Quraysh, of the uh, Muhajirun. Just 85 of the Muhajirun. Right? 
and the bravery that they displayed caused Islam to go where it did. So this is what Allah is saying, that this is gi going to give you your real life. And know that Allah can come between a man and his heart. Meaning what? Both meanings are here. Number one, if your heart is weak, turn to Allah to strengthen it. Number two, if you feel your heart to be strong, don't be deluded that it might not go astray. Turn to Allah for strength. Right? That even between you and your own heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can intervene. And that's why our Prophet would make dua to Allah. Ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qulubana ala ta'atik. Thabbit qulubana ala ta'atik. Oh, the one who moves the hearts back and forth, make my heart firm in your worship. So this is the meaning here that Allah comes between a man and his heart. And fear a trial that will strike uh, those who have not necessarily done any wrong amongst you. It's not just going to hit those who have done zulm and know that Allah Azza wa Jal is uh, Shadid al Iqab. What is the reference here? Some say this is a reference to the future battles that don't be misguided, don't be um, deceived into thinking that khalas, it's all going to be easy, easy uh, stretch from here. Others say that the meaning here is that never feel that life will stop being te uh, full, of, full of temptations, full of fitan. There are always going to be trials and tribulations no matter how long that you live. Remember when you were few and oppressed in the land, fearing that people might يَتَخَطَّفَكُمْ النَّاسِ uh, تَخَطَّفَ means to shoot you down one by one. تَخَطَّفَ means pluck, like one by one. And the meaning here is you don't have strength. In Mecca, you could have been killed one by one. And so Allah is saying, remember when you were few in number in Mecca. مُسْتَضْعَفُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ You were oppressed in the land, weak in the land. Worrying that people would abduct you, kill you one by one. What happened? فَآوَاكُمْ Allah gave you comfort, Medina. وَأَيَّدَكُمْ مِنْ نَصْرِهِ He helped you with his victories, Badr. وَرَزَقَكُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ He gave you good things. The dates of Medina, the waters of Medina. You don't have to worry now about uh, the troubles that you had in Mecca so that you may uh, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. O you who believe, do not betray the trust of Allah and the messenger uh, or betray your own trust while you know the consequences and know that your properties and your children are a trial and that Allah azza wa jal has a uh, great reward. Uh, some say this is in reference to later incidents. Realize as well, by the way, that a lot of times Allah revealed Quran and then it was applied later on. That the exact meaning uh, was not known. In any case, the, the meaning is generic and it applies for every single incident. Uh, let's go to verse number 30. I don't, I don't think I can do every single verse. And remember, when those who disbelieve plotted against you, this is on the night of the Hijrah. So Allah Azza wa Jal recalls back what happened on the night of the Hijrah, which was around a year and a half before this incident. Remember, when they plotted against you to either jail you, uh, that liyuth bituka means tie you up. Because one of the, remember, do, do you remember the story of uh, the plotting where the Quraysh locked themselves up, they made sure everybody knew everybody else in the room. And then shaitan came to him in the form of a tribal leader from Najd. And he said that, I have an idea. So initially they said, we'll, we'll lock him up. And shaitan said, that's not going to work. They said, we'll exile him. Shaitan said, that's not going to work. Then they said, what's your opinion? So he said, we have to kill. This is that reference here. That they said they will exile you, or they're going to kill you, or they're going to tie you up. And وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهِ They plotted and planned, and Allah will also plan, and Allah is the best of uh, planners. And remember as well when they said, that when they heard our verses, they said, قَدْ سَمِعْنَا Enough, we've heard. We've heard enough. لَوْ نَشَاءُ لَقُلْنَا مِثْلَ هَذَا if I wanted to, I could say the same thing as the Qur'an. Verily, these are Asatiya stories of the ancient legends. Who, who said this? Who said this? Uh, Nadr ibn al-Harith. Who was the one, one of the two that was executed. So Allah is referencing him now. Right? And per, now we don't know exactly, but it is not too unreasonable to assume this ayah came down while Nadr was still a prisoner of war. Right? And now he is being mocked at the highest level. That Allah Azza wa Jal is quoting him directly. Remember when you said this, now what? And the next ayah also applies to another. وَإِذْ قَالُوا And this is also another. Remember when they said that, O oh Allah, 
if this should be the truth in kana hadha wal haqq min 'indik fa amtir 'alayna hijaratan min as why don't you send a rain of rocks to destroy us aw i'tina bi 'adhab alim or send us a punishment this was the punishment this was the punishment so allah is reminding another through the quran remember what you said here it is you see the point now right this is exactly what another is saying and now now there is no riwayah in the seerah that says this but i am guessing that the purpose of these verses is so that another hears them we don't know maybe it came right after another was executed but then what would be the purpose so allahu alam it would make sense these verses came down and remember, the Anfal, the spoils, were being decided on the battlefield. Nadr was executed, by the way, after they left the battlefield. On the way back to Medina, Nadr was executed. He was not thrown into the, uh, the, the well. He was, he was executed on the way back. So it makes complete sense that these verses would have been read to Nadr. Or he would have heard these verses, and then he is uh, executed. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ But how could Allah punish them while you are amongst them? In other words, Nadr is being told, did you think that while the Prophet was in Mecca, this would happen? It has to wait until he's in Medina, which is now. Right? Did you think when the Prophet was in Mecca that a punishment will come? How could he punish How could he punish you when the Prophet is amongst you? How can Allah punish them when يستغفرون here there's like seven eight opinions I think the strongest opinion Allah knows best when there are still some amongst them who shall embrace Islam and be forgiven how can Allah punish them right now because still most of Mecca would embrace right so يستغفرون here means they will ask Allah for forgiveness right one opinion is that يستغفرون at this point in time which I find a little bit uh, um, I, I don't agree with this but, but there are many interpretations and then Allah is saying, but why shouldn't He punish them? It makes sense for Allah to punish them after all that they have done. They have stopped people from going to Masjid al-Haram and they are not even qualified to be in charge of it. Verily, only the muttaqun have the right to be in charge of it. And then Allah mocks their prayer at the, at the, at the Kaaba. وَمَا كَانَ صَلَاتُ عِنْدَ الْبَيْتِ إِلَّا مُكَاءً وَتَصْلِيَ The only thing they do around the Kaaba is to whistle and clap. This is their salah. To whistle and clap. Muka'an wa tasdiyah. Muka' is to whistle. And tasdiyah is to clap their hands. And so Allah is saying, what type of salah is this? That you are whistling and, uh, and clapping your hands. So taste the punishment for what you have uh, done. Uh, indeed, those who disbelieve, they spend of their money in order to stop people from coming to the way of Allah. This is the uh, Quraysh when they heard Abu Sufyan's caravan is being attacked they all came together and they donated the biggest monies that they ever had that they ever donated for an army this is a reference to this fundraiser that took place in Mecca for the battle of Badr so Allah is saying فَسَيُنْفِقُونَهَا they will spend it then it will be a source of regret and then they will lose in the end they will be the ones who lose and then those who have disbelieved, they will enter uh, into Jahannam so that Allah will separate the wicked from the good and place the evil people one on top of the other uh, into the fire of hell. Those are the real uh, losers. Uh, say to those who have disbelieved, if you stop, Allah will forgive you what has happened in the past. But if they come back to fight you, then they have the examples of those nations that have gone by. So Allah is telling the Quraysh, look to history. Look to those before you. Stop now, you'll be forgiven. Continue, look at Ad and Thamud and Fir'aun and see where they are now. وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ Continue to do qital against them until there is no fitna. The meaning of fitna, Ibn Abbas said, الْفِتْنَةُ to هِيَ shirk. Fitna here is worshipping other than Allah. Continue to fight them until there is no idolatry and the religion is completely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if they stop then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, aware of what they do and if they turn away then know that Allah is your protector and what a great protector he is uh, verse number 41 is the verse of uh, one-fifth goes to Allah and his messenger uh, we talked about four-fifths goes to the army one-fifth goes to uh, the state and there's a lot of fiqh here, which is not uh, the point over here. Verse number 42. 
Remember when you were on the near side of the valley, meaning the one towards Medina, and they were on the farther side, the Quraysh, and the caravan was in a lower position towards Yambur. So Allah describes the battle of Badr over here. And if the two of you had agreed for a battle, you would never have been able to make the appointment. Something would have happened. Meaning, neither of you really would have done this. If you had planned it, it wouldn't have worked out. But Allah Azza wa Jal did it without your planning. Allah Azza wa Jal accomplished it so that a matter already decreed would take place so that those who perish would perish upon evidence and those who live would live upon evidence. Meaning, those who die, they have seen the reality. Those who live, they have seen the reality. And Allah is Samir and Alim. Remember, when Allah showed you in your dream that they were so few in number. This was the dream that the Prophet saw on the night of Badr, on the morning of Badr. It is said that he just went to sleep for a little bit of time. When he woke up, he was happy. And he said, I saw them and they are very few in number. And Allah is saying, if he had shown you as many as they were, the believers would have lost courage. And they would have disputed amongst themselves. But Allah saved them from this calamity. And remember when he showed you, when you actually met, that they were so few in your eyes. So, verse number 43 is for a dream. Verse number 44 is the actual battlefield. In the dream, that he showed you were few in number. In the actual battlefield, when you met each other, from this we learn, and there are some athar, that when the Sahaba saw the Quraysh for the first time, they were shocked at how few they were. And one of them said, do you think they are 70? Even though there were a thousand. And uh, the other responded, no, I estimate them to be a hundred. This is in uh, um, Al-Tabarani, al tabarani that one of the Sahaba said, do you think they're 70? He goes, no, I think they're 100, even though they were 1,000. So Allah is saying, I showed them so few in number in order that you not fall into uh, chaos, into despair. O you who believe if you encounter a company, uh, meaning from the uh, from the uh, enemy, then stand firm and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that you can be successful. In the khutbah that I gave about dhikr, I mentioned this ayah that one of the ways to overcome fear is dhikr Allah. One of the ways to gain Allah's victory is dhikr Allah and obey Allah and His Messenger and do not fight amongst one another nor do you should you lose courage otherwise your strength will leave you. So, Internal fighting amongst Muslims is a sign of defeat. And notice in the battle of Uhud, Allah mentions the cause of their defeat as exactly تنازعتم, exactly the same verb is used. In Badr, Allah says ولا تنازعوا, so you won. In Uhud, in Surah Ali Imran, as we'll come to, Allah says وتنازعتم في الأمر, and you argued with one another. And that was the cause of defeat, right? So Muslims fighting one another is one of the biggest causes of defeat. And historically, this is so true. Where do we even begin with uh, examples? And obey Allah and His message. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, number 47. Do not be like those who left their houses arrogantly and insolently, insolently wanting to be seen of people and preventing people from uh, the way of Allah. And Allah is well aware of what they do. This is the Quraysh. Allah is describing their arrogance and their kibr. They were flaunting like peacocks, their chests. Allah is saying, Bataran wari'a an nas. They thought that they're going to win. So Allah says, Don't be like them. And then He mentions the story of Suraqa ibn Malik. Or not Suraqa, but Iblis in the, in the form of Suraqa, right? Not Suraqa, Iblis in the form of Suraqa. Remember, when Shaytan made their deeds pleasing to them and said, This is Shaytan in the form of Suraqa. No one can overcome you today from the people, and I will protect you. Meaning, the, kin the, the Kinana will not attack the Quraysh. This is the protection here, right? But when the two armies saw one another, نَكَصَ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ Which is a very powerful expression in Arabic. Uh, there is no English equivalent. But basically he turned his back, put his tail between his, uh, you know, behind and he fled. That's what نَكَصَ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ means, right? And he turned around and he said, I have nothing to do with you lot. إِنِّي بَرِئُ مِّنْكُمْ I see what you do not see. What did he see? The angels. I am fearful of Allah and Allah is shadidul iqab, severe in uh, punishment. Uh, and I think we need to move a little bit faster because we're going... Um, Allah mentions Fir'aun and it is fitting 
that he mentions Fir'aun over here because it was at this point in time that the Fir'aun of the Ummah had just been killed. Okay, so Allah mentions Fir'aun uh, because Abu Jahl had just been killed and he mentions him twice. That Allah says, this isn't the first time I'm killing a Fir'aun. The Fir'aun before had been killed and now Abu Jahl as well had been uh, killed. Uh, let's move on to 50, uh, 58. If you have reason to fear betrayal, then, and this uh, the reason I'm doing this is not related to Badr, it's related to the, the later of Badr, and it's also related to us here uh, in our situation. That Allah is saying, once you have a treaty with the Quraysh, then you're worried they're going to break the treaty. There is a reference here to the conquest of Mecca, because that's what the Prophet did. That he uh, told them that the treaty is no longer valid. So you are never allowed to break the treaty by surprise. A Muslim must honor his word even in the times of war. If you feel that the Quraysh or others are going to break the treaty first, then you need to publicly annul the treaty before you do anything. So you tell them, treaty over. Then you can do whatever you want. But you cannot surprise them. فَمْبِدْ إِلَيْهِمْ Throw it back to them. Both of you are now forewarned. You both are on the same boat. Verily, Allah does not love traitors. A Muslim is never a traitor. Even in war. And this is a very important point. These guys are now, the Islamophobes are now, you know, barking all the time about taqiyya and all of this, you know, ridiculous stuff. Well, it's so explicit here. Yes, it is true that deception is sometimes allowed in war. But deception is not treason. There's a big difference. What is deception? Deception means you go right and eventually you're going to come back in the left. Right? Deception means that uh, you, you use double meaning words. There, you don't, there's no promise. There's no treaty. There's no, there's no contract. It's just that you, you have a tactic of war. But treason means you make a promise, you swear an oath, and you break it. This is never allowed in any circumstance. And Allah is very explicit over here. And then verse 60, Allah says, Prepare against them whatever you're able to of power, of quwa, and of horses, that you may uh, inflict fear into the enemies of Allah and your enemies and others whom you do not know, but Allah knows. In other words, there are people you don't know them to be enemies. But Allah knows what they think of you. And when they see your power, you will terrify them as well. There's a wisdom in you showing your strength. And whatever you give in the way of Allah, Allah will return it back to you. And you will not be uh, wronged. Our Prophet ﷺ interpreted this verse and he said, أَلَا إِنَّ الْقُوَّةَ الرَّمِي أَلَا إِنَّ الْقُوَّةَ الرَّمِي That verily, quwa that Allah talks about here is in archery. The quwa that Allah is talking about here is archery. So he said the main quwa for his time was uh, archery. And if they incline towards peace, then you as well incline towards peace and put your trust in Allah. Verily, Allah is Sami and Alim. This is a very important verse. The asl in Islam is not war. The reason that we go to war is لِتَكُونَ كَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَةِ and if the enemy is not preventing us from this, and they're willing to have peace, then Allah is saying, If they want to lay their arms and have peace, you as well lay down your arms and have peace. And this is what the Prophet did in Hudaybiyyah. Right? This is exactly what he did in Hudaybiyyah. So by the way, a lot of the Islamic political science is now being told in Badr that the Muslims are now becoming a real political entity. So Allah is laying out some of the foundations that will happen uh, uh, later on. But if they want to deceive you, then Allah is sufficient. Allah will take care of you. He is the one who has protected you and supported you with His help and with the believers. And now this is a beautiful verse that all of you know. وَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ Verse 63. Allah is the one who has combined all of your hearts. If you were to have given all of this world, you could not have brought their hearts together. Rather, it was Allah who brought it together. He is Azizun Hakim. Once again, unity is a cause of victory. Disunity is a cause of defeat. O you who believe, Allah is sufficient for you and for whoever follows you of the believers. Whoever follows you, Allah is sufficient for him. O you who, O Prophet, urge the believers to battle, 
Now here is where uh, these rulings are given of turning around and not turning around. If there are 20 who are strong amongst you, patient amongst you, they shall overcome 200. And if there are 100, they shall overcome 1,000 amongst you. So uh, 20 to 200. And 100 to 1,000. That is 1 to 10 basically. A ratio of 1 to 10. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-ana khaffafa Allahu ankum. Now, what is going on here? Some scholars say that Allah Azza wa Jal is saying if the ratio is 1 to 10, you will win. Think about that. 1 to 10. Therefore, you have no excuse to turn and flee. If the ratio is more than 1 to 10, sorry, less than 1 to 10, 1 to 20, 1 to 30, then you may flee. Because remember, in the beginning, Allah said, never flee. Now in this verse, the ratio 1 to 10 is given. In the next verse, Al-ana Allahu ankum. Allah has made it easy for you. Now Allah has made it easy for you. Because He knows you are weak. So if there are 100 strong amongst you, uh, steady, they will defeat 200. And if there are 1,000, they will defeat 2,000. The ratio goes down to what? 1 to 2 now. Very big difference, right? So, and the majority of madhahib are on this. That if the Muslim army is half the army of the uh, non-Muslims then they're not allowed to flee that's a pretty imagine subhanAllah but Allah promises that if you have 100 you will overcome 200 if you have 1000 we thank Allah it wasn't the previous one right 100 versus 1000 Allah is saying it's going to happen then Allah says Allah knows you have a weakness so he has made it down 1, 2, uh, 2 then we get to the issue of the prisoners of war 67 ما كان لنبيين Makana is the Arabic phrase for it is not befitting. It's not appropriate. It's not appropriate for any prophet that he have prisoners of war until yuthkhina fil ard means establish his power. Until he shows his dominion. And dominion is shown by, by establishing political power, by execution, by many things is shown. Hatta yuthkhina fil ard. You wanted some of the arad dunya the commodities of this world, but Allah wants the akhirah. Now the Muslims by and large, they also wanted the ransom because it brought them a lot of money. 4,000 dirhams was a lot of money. That's like a, a fortune. And it wiped out the savings of most of the Quraysh. That's why even Abu Sufyan said, I've lost one son. You think I'm gonna uh, lost the, you know so much of this? You think I'm gonna lose my money as well? Let him stay there, right? Abu Sufyan said this, that he did not, because literally it would make him bankrupt. And Abbas, down to the last penny, the process took from his own uncle. Remember, he said, "I don't have any money." So he said, "No, you have this, this, this." He took everything from him, right? So it was a very large sum for them. So they wanted this, and Allah says, "You wanted this, but Allah Azza wa Jal wanted something else." Were it not for a kitab min Allah. What is this kitab min Allah? There's a number of interpretations. The first interpretation is, were it not for the fact that Allah had already decreed you would do this. So it's qadr. That's the first interpretation. The second interpretation, kitab min Allah here means that were it not for the fact that Allah had decreed that anybody who does something without knowledge will be forgiven. And you didn't have knowledge. So this is one interpretation. A third interpretation is that kitabu uh, min Allah over here means were it not for the fact that Allah had allowed for your ummah prisoners of war and war booty which he never allowed for anybody else then you would have been punished so there's a number of interpretations here but the point being some decree from Allah prevented this uh, punishment now that this decree has come go ahead and kulu mimma ghanimtum halalan tayyiba go ahead and eat of this ghanima war booty the prisoners of war money as it is all lawful and Allah is ghafoor and rahim O Prophet say to those who are uh, prisoners of war amongst you and this is primarily to Abbas Abbas used to swear by Allah wallahi this ayah came down for me even though, of course, it's more than him, but primarily it's people like him, right? Al-Abbas used to say, Wallahi, this ayah Allah revealed for my sake. That say to those who are prisoners of war, if Allah knows in your hearts any good, meaning you will be Muslim, then He shall give you better than what has been taken away. 
meaning your Islam is better than all of this money. And Allah will forgive you and Allah is Ghafoor Rahim. And it wasn't just Islam. Abbas said, I wish I had more money that he took because everything he gave, I got 10 times more back. Right? This is Abbas himself is saying, I wish I had more that he could have taken because I got 10 times more back. But if those prisoners want to betray you, then they have already betrayed Allah and Allah has given you power over them. فَأَمْكَنَ minhum means they tried to trick you, they tried to kill you, they couldn't win then, they're not going to win again. And Allah is Alim and Hakim. And by the way, we're going to come to the fact one or two of the prisoners of war, they uh, betrayed their trusts. They made promises they're not going to fight again, that they did this. But then when they went back, they fought again. Some of them were executed. And that's prediction here. It's being predicted. Don't worry. You will catch them and you will have power over them. If they betray you, you will catch them, you will have power over them. In the battle of Uhud, we're going to meet a few prisoners, one prisoner in particular, he betrayed his trust. And this is, ayah is being a reference to that. Now, the, the ending of the uh, surah. Now, by the way, so, after the battle of Badr, the commandments came down. Every last Muslim in Mecca has to immigrate to Medina. Every last Muslim in Mecca has to immigrate to Medina. No excuse. You're not allowed to remain. So Allah says that uh, those who believe and they immigrate and they fight in, with their money and their uh, lives in the way of Allah. This is the, this is the uh, muhajirun. And those who help. Awo, these are the ansar. Wa nasaru. That's why Allah uses the verb nasaru. This is the ansar. Right? So, these are the Muhajirun. These are the, the Ansar. These two, they are the helpers one of the other. Those who believed but did not immigrate. This is the Muslims in Mecca. You have no walaya. Walaya here. Uh, there's a number of interpretations. One of them means you have nothing to do with them, but that's a little bit harsh. Another is you don't have any responsibilities towards them. Because one of the meanings of wilaya, just like wali, what is a wali? The wali is somebody who takes charge of, the guardian. You have no guardianship, you don't have to protect them. Illa an yuhajiru, except if they, hatta yuhajiru, until they make hijrah. So the, the Muslims remaining in Mecca, you have no legal obligation to protect them. مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ وَلَيْتِ مِنْ شَيْنِ حَتَّى يُهَاجِرُوا وَإِنْ إِسْتَنْصَرُوكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ But if they beg you to help, فَعَلَيْكُمْ النَّصْرِ Then go ahead and help them إِلَّا عَلَى قَوْمٍ بَيْنَكُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ ميثاق Except if it be against a people that you have a treaty with. Now this ayah, is especially important in the modern political world that we live in. There are many Muslims who are begging us for help. And we help them as much as we can with dua all the time, unconditionally. Other types of help, physical help and financial help. We need to see our political situation. Allah very clearly says, if you have a covenant with a group and they're asking you to help against those whom you have a covenant with, then you are forgiven. I think it's very clear from this ayah what we are referring to. Because, wallahi, it's a very deep topic here. And I have spoken about this more explicitly in other places, but now is not the time to go into this tangent here. That there is an obligation to help all oppressed Muslims. Without any conditions, we, we help them with dua. We help them by spreading their plight, by advertising their issues. We do this all the time. But in terms of physically helping, and in terms of financially helping, we need to look at our own situation as well. And this ayah is very clear, that there is an excuse for political reasons. It doesn't affect the bonds of brotherhood. Because notice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that uh, they are that they are your brothers in faith. 
فعليكم النصر go ahead and help إلا على قوم بينك وبينهم ميثاق unless there is a treaty between the two of you and Allah is uh, aware of what you do and as for those who have disbelieved they help one another if you do not do so meaning if you don't ally with the other believers then there will be much fitna and oppression in this world in other words Allah is saying others will unite against you if you don't unite as well then there will be much fitna and fasad on the earth. This is what the point of the verse is. Others might have their differences, but they'll all unite against you. This is the reality. They might have their differences, but they will unite against you. If you don't unite amongst yourselves, illa tafaluhu means unite against yourself, amongst yourselves. There will be much fitna and fasad in the uh, earth. And those who have believed, and those who have immigrated, and those who have fought in the way of Allah, and those who gave shelter and aid, muhajun and ansar, these are the real believers. For them is the forgiveness and the uh, noble provision. And those who believed after, meaning the immigration, and immigrated, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْ بَعْدُ so after the, uh, the, the hijrah, after the hijrah of the, of the uh, muhajirun, if they believe, so this applies to our times, this applies uh, after the battle of uh, uh, Uhud, it applies in every single stage after the initial stage. And by the way, so we talked about this many times, in early Islam, was sabiqun al-awwalun. Your time of embracing Islam gave you your rank in Islam. And this verse also references this point. The earlier you embraced Islam, the higher up you are in Islam. And the later you embraced, the lower you are. And then Allah says, وَأُولُوا الْأَرْحَامِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلَى بِبَعْضُ And the ties of blood, these are stronger in the book of Allah. It is said, this is one interpretation, that this verse annulled the condition of the Treaty of Medina, in which the Muhajir and the Ansar would inherit from one another. Do you remember this? clause, right? The the mu'akha that took place, right? One of the conditions was they will inherit. When this verse came down, this annulled that clause. That families are closer when it comes to inheritance. Verily, Allah is aware of all things. Uh, we did a very brief uh, tafsir of Surah Al-An'am. And pretty much every single verse is related, Surah Al-Anfal, excuse me, and every single verse is related to uh, the Battle of Badr, inshaAllah ta'ala, next Wednesday, after, <clears throat> after how many lessons of Badr? I think seven lessons of Badr. We will now begin uh, the interim between Badr and Uhud, and then we have probably around maybe ten lessons of Uhud, because Uhud is uh, a lot of lessons and victories, uh, and lessons as well. And was it a victory or not? That's also an entire lesson. Inshallah ta'ala, we will continue next Wednesday. We don't have time for Q&A. Uh, is there any announcements to be made? Before?